when I was a kid, breakfast was the most exciting meal of the day. And I always thought, when I get older, I can eat it all day long. But thankfully for my dental hygiene, I eventually moved on to other cravings. The 80s was a golden age of instructional guitar videos. Hot Licks, Star Licks, REH Video. But they were expensive, 20 or 30 bucks. This was, you know, big money when all you had was a paper route or a job at the mall. You really had to budget. Yeah, oh, no, wait, yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, oh, yeah, no. Yes! But as an adult with a job, man, anything was possible. So I made a short list of all the instructional videos I'd always wanted to see. The most enticing ones were the obscure ones. Back in high school, my bootleg copy of Eric Johnson on Austin City Limits had arrived on top of the fossilized remains of a Starlix video that my friend had taped over. The instructional video, whatever it was, was long gone wiped out by Eric Johnson's ethereal pentatonics. At the beginning of the tape, there was nothing left but the trailers. Jeff Watson, Carlos Cavazzo, all these guys that I knew. But there was one other guy I didn't recognize. He was this skinny guy with big hair, and he was doing some insane thing where he'd play on top of the neck with his left hand, kind of like Eddie's tapping. And I was fine, but what I really remembered was the picking ability. It seemed incredible, an almost otherworldly level of speed and clarity. Now maybe this was just the fog of memory, or maybe this mysterious figure was truly a talent. I had to find out. But who was he? He had a stage name. It sounded like... Michael Angelo. Not the Renaissance artist and not the Ninja Turtle. Michael Angelo was the guitar player from a metal band called Nitro. An insane late 80s creation that sounded like what would happen if you dosed all the members of Poison with the Captain America Super Soldier Serum. Stacks upon stacks of vocals. Axes and axes of guitars. And cans and cans of Aquanet. It would have been easy enough to write all this off as just P.T. Barnum-level spectacle, except for the fact that there were serious chops on display. So Michelangelo was indeed the mystery subject of the lost Starlix trailer. That video, Starlix Master Series Michelangelo, was no longer in print, but I found another one made a few years later by none other than Doug Marks of Metal Method. It was called Speed Kills. It was originally a VHS release that had appeared in 1991, right around the time of Ingve's REH tape. I hadn't known about it then, and it was now the early 2000s, but it had been reincarnated on DVD, so I immediately ordered a copy. And when I popped it into my PowerBook G4, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Picking was so articulate, it was almost like a sampler or a video game. Ingve's playing had an earthy, almost bluesy quality, which breathed with rhythmic and mechanical variation. It was great, but this was a robot attack of computerized precision that just kept going and going. But it wasn't just the sheer endurance that was impressive. I knew that sound, that clarion blast of ascending speed. It was a historically important hallmark of fast musicianship. The scale. All my favorite TV shows had these awesome string parts I couldn't even touch on guitar. Most of the time, it was a wicked ascending scale leading into the chorus. The way these killer blasts of scale or speed were casually stuffed into primetime theme songs was so commonplace, you hardly paid any attention to them. This was devastating playing, just hanging out there in the background like window dressing. 
which made it easy to write off as no big deal. But when you actually stop to consider the level of skill this would require on guitar, it was almost embarrassing. An entire string section played that line in unison. If that was the skill level of the average session violinist, then that was pretty amazing. Because when it came to guitar, you'd have to get Mike, Ingve, Paul, Vinny, Al, and John all in the same studio, and you'd still be a few hands short. And this was weird. Because just about every guitar lesson book since the beginning of time contained detailed instructions for doing precisely this. Alternate picking. A sequence of downstrokes and upstrokes matched up with three note per string fingerings in the fretting hand. You'd play three notes, then move to the next string, then the next string, and so on. Just down up, down up forever, no matter what the left hand is doing. Seems simple enough, right? But because alternate picking was based in twos, and scales were, for the most part, fretted in groups of threes, well, the least common multiple was six. This meant that the left hand and right hand sequences quickly went out of sync. And it was only after you played six notes, or two complete strings of the scale, that they'd meet back up again. And if you wanted to find actual recorded examples of lesson book style scale playing beyond this two string limit, you really had to hunt around, mostly among virtuoso instructional videos. Mike did it on Master Series in 1986. And again on Speed Kills in 1991. Paul Gilbert did it across all six strings on his hugely influential Intense Rock in 1988. And Steve Morse did too a year later on Power Lines with his usual effortless aplomb. So did Richie Kotzen. Ironically, who would eventually become better known for not even using a pick at all. Richie's frequent collaborator, Greg Howe, did all kinds of cool patterning on his tape. But no straight scales. The same was true for Al Di Miola, who focused more on sequences. Which was interesting because Al was a Berkeley grad and more formally trained than most rock players. Since scale playing was the academic way, you'd think we'd see it. Virtuoso pioneer Vinnie Moore, on his two influential instructional videos, similarly chose patterns over scales. Though he did play a scale in an interview once. And of course, Ingve's system wasn't really a pure alternate picking approach at all. Like Ingve, Tony McAlpine demonstrated a similarly fluid sound on his tape by stealthily infusing legato notes into his scale playing. In fact, the more you looked, the more surprising it was just how infrequently you could find clear examples of this supposedly simple task, even on hardcore instructional material. And when it came to everyday players, forget it. Considering the crazy amount of guitar practice that happened in the 80s alone, we should be absolutely surrounded by average players capable of acing this basic exercise. That's the way it is on piano. That's even the way it is on notoriously difficult instruments like the violin. But when it came to guitar, despite the millions of notes played by soloists in the last half century, the overwhelming absence of scale playing and rock music by any method, but especially by alternate picking, started to seem downright suspicious. All of which made Mike's playing on Speed Kills, filmed in all its close-up glory, very impressive indeed. If there was any mystery as to how Ingve played scales back in the day, now in the age of digital video, it was obvious that Mike was doing it across the strings using three note per string alternate picking. Or was he? 
Okay, so when Mike played the example slowly, it was clearly alternate picking, even if it was kind of an exaggerated alternate picking for the purposes of demonstration. And there was no way that could be his only approach because you simply couldn't do it very fast. Sure enough, as soon as Mike began to speed up, something mystifying happened. Gone. The exaggerated bouncing totally disappeared and the fingers and the hand became locked in place. It was like some kind of impossibly smooth robot arm gliding across the strings. Huh, wait a minute. Three, six, nine. It really did look like three individual pick strokes per string. But if all the jumping movements had disappeared, how was he getting from one string to another? It was truly a mystery. And what Mike said about alternate picking on speed kills only deepened that mystery. And the real secret to alternate picking is the ability to hit a new string on an upstroke so that you continue the down up. Exactly. The string change was the challenge, and Mike knew it. For years, we used to think that speed was the obstacle. But when you really thought about it, lots of people could pick fast. Fast tremolo playing was common, even among players who weren't really known for fast picking. But that was only part of the story. Sure, some weekend warrior might be able to figure out a way of moving their hands almost as fast and giving Mike a run for his money. But when it came to raw speed on a single string, Mike really wasn't that much faster than other players. It was picking fast and moving across the strings at the same time. That was his superpower. No matter how complex the string changes became, Mike seemed to navigate them with all his speed without mistakes. And that incredible string switching accuracy at high speed was the real key to the Lamborghini. I went back to watching the video, rewinding specific scenes over and over again. Over the next few weeks, I must have watched the scale thing a hundred times. I just kept rewinding it and rewinding it. I wasn't even sure what I was looking for. I just kept watching. And I don't know if it was the 200th repetition or the 201st. But just when I was about to check into Scale Players Anonymous, that's when I saw it. I played it again, a little slower. Wait, now even slower. Then I went frame by frame. Right there. The hand was rotating. I could see it. It was rotating downward, right at the sixth note of the scale. That was the second string change, and it was an upstroke. But hold on a second. It didn't rotate after the first string change, which was the third note of the scale, a downstroke back here. No, this downward rotation definitely only happened at the second string change. Which meant that whatever his hand position was during the first string change, it was working for that one and therefore didn't need to change. Now, I was no mechanical engineer, but if you had to rotate your hand downward, away from your usual position, I knew that could mean only one thing about the way you normally held your pick. The logic was inescapable. Upward pick slanting. Suppose instead of holding your pick with a downward slant like Ingve, or even a neutral one, you instead held it with an upward slant. Bizarre, I know, but work with me on this. Now, when you played a downstroke, your pick would launch right up into the air like this. 
and this would actually be a very useful thing. Because if you play an ascending scale using this upward pick slam, the downstroke on the third note would send the pick straight up into the air. From this point, all you'd have to do to make the string change would be to drop straight back down again for the upstroke. And just like that, you're on the new string. And this was pretty amazing, because we used to think that alternate picking was a back and forth movement like this. But the speed kills discovery is that Mike wasn't picking back and forth at all. He was picking here, diagonally. And that was how he could get from one string to another string without hitting anything. Pretty sneaky, Mike. And this is why it didn't look like Mike was doing anything in particular to get from the D string to the G string. Because really, he wasn't. Thanks to Mike's upward pick slant, the third note of the scale, the downstroke, just sailed right over the top of the G string. Effortless. There was no jumping movement necessary to make this happen because the pick was already aimed upward to begin with. This meant that switching to the G string was as easy as playing a downstroke on the D string. Here it is. No effort at all. Now, he was above the G string, and all he had to do was drop down on the other side with an upstroke. But with the second note, something really interesting happens. His hand begins to rotate. You can see it starting to turn, and then by the third note, the upstroke, it was fully rotated downward. What is he doing? Of course, he's reversing the pick slant. If an upward pick slant sends your pick into the air when the last note on the string is a downstroke, then a downward pick slant would do exactly the opposite. It would cause upstrokes to rise up into the air. Watch it happen. The pick is hovering in the air above the G string, ready to dive toward the B string. There it is. Now we're on the B string. We are beyond the two string limit. This is uncharted territory, right? Well, not exactly, because the B string starts on a downstroke, just like the D string did. So all Mike has to do is quickly return to his upward pick slant, and then he can rock it right over the top of the next string using a downstroke again. Right over the top, just like the G string. The high E string was the last string of the lick, so we wouldn't need any more pick slanting changes. We just drop down on the far side, again, just like we did before. Watch the drop. Like nothing. And once we're there, we're home free to finish the phrase. I would never have imagined that all these movements were happening, or even possible. At the speeds Mike played, how could there even be enough time? I mean, look at this. Well, sure, Mike was fast in metronome time. But once again, that was all relative. Speed Kills proved that there was actually plenty of mechanical time. Three notes worth, to be precise. Three notes was all Mike needed to go from upward pick slanting to downward pick slanting and back again. This stealthy two-way pick slanting maneuver helped him surpass the two-string limit and connect together four complete strings of an ascending scale. Amazing. I immediately picked up my guitar to try it. Mike held his pick in a way I hadn't seen before. Three fingers planted between the pickups, with the forearm creating a kind of a bridge over the strings. This felt really awkward, and I couldn't do it at all. So I ditched the idea and went back to my usual setup. Just sitting on the bridge with the fingers loose. Man, this was weird at first. I wasn't used to coordinating other arm movements during alternate picking, at least not that I was aware of. As I worked on this, I realized that Mike's two-way pick slanting had an interesting property. Sure, you could start with an upward pick slant if you wanted. Then you could play your first three notes using that upward pick slant to get to the next string. Then on the next string, you could do three more notes, but this time with rotation to change the pick slant. So you'd finish with downward pick slanting. But this meant that the next six note chunk had to actually start with downward pick slanting 
in order to connect smoothly. In fact, this would be true for every chunk of six notes after the first one. You'd always be coming from a previous chunk that finished with downward pick slanting. So the pick slant would constantly be reversing itself on every new string. And you would always have the same window of time to do it. Three notes. At the heart of this constant reversal was a simple and ingenious six note pattern. Down, up, rotate. Up, down, rotate. The first string of the pattern started on a down stroke with downward pick slanting and went down, up, rotate. And the next string started on an up stroke with upward pick slanting and went up, down, rotate. And these two patterns, sandwiched together, formed the fundamental six note chunk of Mike's scalar approach. The key here is that every time the pick moves to a new string, it has to be up here, above the strings, so you don't accidentally hit anything. It wasn't enough to just know the pick strokes and hope for the best. I and lots of other people tried that and it didn't work. What you really needed was a specific recipe of hand movements to show you how to actually get over the strings at high speed. And this simple six movement sequence was exactly how Mike did it. Within a few weeks of practicing this, I could feel the coordination starting to happen. By simply memorizing the six note sequence as a chunk, it just became a unit that you'd trigger in your brain. It could be two strings, or it could be six. It could be ascending or descending. Down, up, rotate, up, down, rotate. Man, I needed to get this on a t-shirt. Seeing these movements all over speed kills was exciting. You can't play faster than banging on one note. It was like those little oval cue marks in the upper right hand corner of the movie screen that let the projectionist know when it was time to change reels. Once I saw Mike's two way pick slanting, I couldn't unsee it. But I still had to wonder how amazing would it be to actually get a close up look at the real thing? Technology to the rescue. When it didn't crash, the little Firewire camera and hacked up custom software produced every bit the peek into Mike's mysteries I could have hoped for. There it was. The perfectly executed roll over the top of the string was like the perfect timing of a hurdler, sailing right over the barrier without breaking stride or slowing down. And just like on speed kills, strings that began with downstrokes also ended with downstrokes. Because of the pick's upward slant, it simply stepped right over the top of the next string with no extra effort. Then on the next string, the magic happened. Upstroke, then down, then rotate. The way the pick lifted right up into the air was unmistakable. Then boom, onto the next string to keep going. Repeating licks made the movement even easier to see. In this two string circular sequence, every time the pick moved to the lower string, it did so by way of upward pick slanting. Downstroke on the higher string, and then the closest of shaves as the pick clears the high E string and hits the lower string on an upstroke. Flawless. The way back was when the rotation needed to happen. We'd play three more notes on the lower string. Then on the last note, we'd have the telltale switch to downward pick slanting. There it is. The pick is suspended in midair, just waiting to dive right back to the top string. And the whole sequence would repeat. 
Despite the camera's 640 by 480 resolution, the precision ballet of Mike's mechanical approach couldn't have been clearer. And so was the consistency. No matter what I asked him to play, almost all the takes were keepers. Half the time, he'd be done playing the line before I could even record it. This ascending fours pattern, starting on an upstroke, was the high gothic of two-way pick slanting. It was one of the most complicated patterns you'd likely encounter in everyday playing, because a full cycle of the pattern contained two instances where you had only one note on a string. The accuracy of Mike's take on this was just absurd. Watching this unfold only a few feet in front of me was like watching an all-star throw a ball at 90 miles an hour and place it right over the outside corner of the plate. I barely made it on this camera. <laughs> I can maybe try it a little lower. And the fact that Mike had this level of control with a bizarre video contraption on his guitar was even more impressive. I'm just kind of getting used to this camera. It okay. feels real strange. So it is. Now I'm getting used to it. Very weird. Ready? The camera with the mounting arm weighed several pounds and took up half the fretboard. Depending upon how you sat with it, you couldn't even see your picking hand. <laughs> with the post sticking up in his face, it's a wonder I didn't blind him. Add to that the red light syndrome of needing to perform on a dime as soon as I hit record. Ready? And it became clear just how baked in and reliable these movements really were for him. The million dollar question is how they got that way. I taught myself yeah. how, to, how to alternate pick. I would just do simple rows like. Power and repeatability with which Mike played this. It was clear that the ascending scale wasn't just an exercise. Um, yeah, I'm just, and that, was that an actual example of something you practiced early on? That is the riff. The, it was the exercise, the one Mike used to develop his picking technique much in the same way I'd been able to do by copying his movements. But Mike didn't have anyone to copy. How the hell did he learn to do all this? Just that riff a thousand times. You know? And what was it that Mike learned by repeating the ascending scale thousands of times? I asked myself, why is it that I can alternate pick sometimes and I couldn't other times? You know, and I, I was 14 years old here, 15 years old. And I used to, like, I would, I would be able to play this really fast and clean. And other times I couldn't play it at all. It would be, it would be slot. And I started, I tried to figure out why. It, I didn't know. You know, it was, it was random. But what was random, Mike? The first seven notes. And why would the first seven notes of the scale be random? Of course. Think about it. If you're an upward pick slanter like Mike, and you try and play an ascending scale starting on a downstroke, everything will be fine until you reach the sixth note of the lick. That's when your pick will be stuck. Here, between the strings, making it awkward, if not impossible, to get to the seventh note, which is way over here. And stuck is exactly where you'll stay. Repetition after repetition. Thousands of them, in Mike's case. Until you can figure out how to get that pick over the string in a way that is smooth and efficient. I had spent a decade in a world where gravity pulled down and pick slants mirrored that pull. But Mike obviously came from a bizarro planet where gravity didn't exist. He had developed the unusual habit of slanting his pick upward. This gave him equal but opposite powers from Ingve and Eric. But Mike didn't stop there. He devised a clever way to temporarily rotate his hand into a downward pick slant whenever he wanted. Sure, it was a way to conquer the scale, but more importantly, it was a map to the universe of picking possibilities. For the first time, I knew exactly where I could go.
anywhere. 